This is Janet Henderson, the uh, chair of Book Sandwiched In. Welcome to our fourth uh, session of books that the committee chose that we felt were of interest to everyone. Um, the, um, the, there are two more um, books that will be reviewed the coming Mondays. Uh, so uh, please continue to join us for those events. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce you to the two ladies who will be presenting our book today, The Queens of Animation, The Untold Story of the Women Who Transformed the World of Disney and Made Cin Cinematic History by Natalie Holt. Um, Melanie Hunter holds a bachelor's uh, and master's in English from the University of Tulsa. She spent 11 years as an assistant professor of English at Tulsa Community College. She finally decided to pursue her lifelong dream of being a writer and has completed more than 50 ghostwriting projects over the last couple of years while working on her own fiction and poetry. She works as a customer service associate with Central Library Circulation. She uh, is working with Heather Loz Lozano, who is a youth associate at South Broken Arrow um, Branch Library. She completed her um, MLIS from OU and received her undergraduate degree 20 minutes from Disneyland, fueled by Mickey Mouse-shaped pretzels. Um, the book is interesting. The ladies who are presenting it are also interesting. Um, enjoy this review. Please wait till the uh, close to the end of the session to ask questions. I will read those questions for uh, Melanie, Melanie and Heather to answer. Thank you, Heather, Melanie. Hi, thank you so much. We are very excited to be here. I'm just loading up our Hi. slideshow. Disney is such a visual medium, as we all know, and so we wanted to make sure you had plenty um, to see because I think these ladies are best introduced through their art. Um, so we're going to kick it off. This is Melanie and I. Um, we're going to <laughs> kick it off with a bit of Disney trivia. So our first question, what was the name of Walt Disney's first cartoon character? Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And what does the acronym EPCOT stand for? Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Um, if you got these answers right, or you were interested in the answers, this might be the book for you. It's full of lots of fun tidbits um, regarding Disney. Want to tell us a little bit about it, Melanie? Yeah, um, author Natalia Holt details not only the untold story of these pioneering women, but she also explores the changes in technology as well as social, cultural, and political upheavals that impacted the film industry in general and Disney in particular. From world wars to the civil rights movement to changing attitudes regarding gender roles, Disney animators, both men and women, confronted a host of challenges while transforming the world of cinema forever. Um, Holt focuses on a small but scrappy uh, group of mostly young women who joined Walt from nearly the beginning, including the great but somewhat unsung Mary Blair, uh, whose artwork lives on in such Disney creations as the iconic, if somewhat irritating, um, It's a Small World theme park ride. Um, Holt's attention is really directed at the feature films rather than the animated shorts that Disney got its start with. Um, those were the purview really of the male animators and indeed most of the female animators thought that the shorts were rather juvenile. They depended on violence and stereotypes for their humor. So um, instead um, Holt focuses on the feature length animated films so it the book begins with the making of the beloved Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and works its way through most of the Disney catalog up through Frozen, um, all seen through the lens of the women who uh, worked sometimes under extremely difficult conditions for the famed studio. 
Um, Holt also explores numerous themes throughout the book, um, as well as walks the reader through a history of filmmaking and animation technology. It's really quite fascinating. Um, she talks about the introduction of, for example, multiplane cameras, um, Technicolor. Oh, there's the multiplane ca camera that Heather has in her slide there. So you can see how enormous it was. It wasn't a, a minor uh, a thing to have at a studio. Um, she also talks about the advent of Technicolor, optical printers, Xerox machines, CinemaScope, which is widescreen, um, and surround sound, just to name a few. Um, also, what I find interesting is that, ironically, the title, The Queens of Animation, it's taken from the nickname of the women who worked in the ink and paint department. These were the women who basically cleaned up the drawings of the main animators. However, the book focuses on the women who worked in the story department. Um, they were much more instrumental in the making of the films, including developing specific characters and creating the artistic uh, designs and the looks of the film and so on. So it's kind of ironic that the name comes from, from the ink, de and de uh, ink and paint department rather than the story department. But in any event, these women were all fascinating and uh, we're gonna talk about each one of them in turn, she focuses on five ma major uh, uh, employees, uh, starting with Mary Blair. So Heather, give us some more information about Ms. Blair. Uh, Mary Blair is probably the most prominent of the group um, as she contributed to many of the 20th, uh, 20th century's most famous Disney films. She's actually from McAllister, Oklahoma. And she moved to California as a girl, um, went to art school and was extremely drawn to animation. Uh, the author seems to consider her the most gifted of the artists, but I think it's also because she's one of the most prominent and most um, information is available on Mary Blair. Um, also, she worked as a commercial artist as well, so her scope extends a little bit beyond Disney. Um, she worked for Haynes and Paul Mall and Dutch Boy Paint. Um, but perhaps uh, most importantly, many of her drawings in the studio were found in the morgue. And um, that's where old work was stored and she provided inspiration for even Frozen. Um, so her legacy lives on quite spectacularly. Her use of color and her experiences abroad and her feelings as shared by Walt of childlike wonder and international harmony informed her work. Um, her personal life, however, was quite messy. Her husband was an alcoholic, a philanderer, and he was quite abusive. Um, her eldest son had to be institutionalized for schizophrenia, which they think could have been brought on by drug use. Um, so her personal unhappiness was in stark contrast to much of her beautiful and inspirational art. Yeah, she was truly amazing. Um, and one of her good friends actually was Retta Scott. Um, in fact, uh, they weren't only just good friends, they became roommates for a few years um, while Retta was still unmarried and uh, Mary Blair's husband was serving in World War II. Um, Retta's talent was particularly in drawing animals. Um, so she was the one of the primary forces behind the timeless classic Bambi, um, though she worked on many other features too. She also appeared in a promotional video for Walt Disney Studios, uh, The Reluctant Dragon, it was called. And uh, she likely provided inspiration for a whole generation of young girls who you know, saw themselves uh, in the, the potential of becoming an, an animator as well. Um, she was also emblematic of the fact that Walt was very insistent that the females he hired have a very thick skin and, you know, the, the males could be quite hard on them. Um, so while many of the women struggled to, to uh, have themselves heard, Retta made her impact by designing a rather fearsome dog. I think you can see some of the outlines of it in the slide there um, for one of the rougher Bambi sequences. And while some people thought it might be <clears throat> you know, too overwhelming for the children who might watch it. Retta insisted it be kept and uh, she made her voice heard. Um, Grace Huntington, in addition to her work on some of the classic films, Grace was an avid pilot and broke records um, to altitude several times. She was fascinated by airplanes and constantly disappointed that she was not allowed to play a bigger role in the aviation industry. She was bolder than many of her cohorts and she spoke up in meetings often, but was still um, found, finding her ideas disregarded by the men in the room. I think it's super interesting that if you look for more information on Grace, her Disney work is mentioned, but not a lot of her art. It's the aviation that she's most recognized for now. And I feel like the Grace we met in the book would be with pride at that information. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, another one of the women that Holt focuses on is Sylvia Holland. Um, unlike the other four women that she focuses on, Sylvia was older when she was hired by Walt. Um, she was already a widow with two children. Um, while that was unusual for the time, part, uh, part of what happened during World War II, because the men were at war, uh, more women entered the workforce in general and, and um, even uh, married women and older women. So uh, Sylvia was part of that trend. Um, she originally hailed from Britain, but she moved to Los Angeles for the health of her uh, young son. Um, her first major contribution to the studio was the lovely Waltz of the Flowers chapter in the original Fantasia. Um, but she also wrote the original adaptation of The Little Mermaid way back in 1941. So uh, that idea was around a long time before the film, of course, actually got made. And then finally, Bianca Michel. Um, while Bianca was the first of the group at the studio, she was also one of the first to leave permanently. Many of the other women were laid off, lured away, or otherwise professionally or personally occupied for parts of their career. And although they came back to Disney when money or projects were available, um, she was actually born in Italy, and thus she was an incredible asset in the making of Pinocchio, as she could read the book in the original Italian and soften the originally very disturbing tale. Yeah, and you can see from the slides how um, distinct all of these women's um, artistic creations were. So they were quite varied in 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 their contributions. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know they often worked under incredibly difficult conditions. Sometimes the harassment could be quite intense. Um, and Heather, I know you were really struck by the opening scene of the book. The book opens with. Um... Bianca giving an idea in the story meeting and it being very poorly received, so poorly, in fact, that, that they chased her down the hallway, literally broke down her office door and started screaming, this won't do. And I thought it was a dream sequence because it just seems so absurd that someone would react that way to an idea they didn't appreciate. But this is what she had to deal with, it was what actually happened to her. So. I mean, it wasn't all bad. The golden age of Disney brought with it great success and innovation. Um, even against the backdrop of the Great Depression, Disney was successful, right? Yeah, um, it was interesting because the shorts that Disney produced in the early period um, against the backdrop of the Great Depression were quite successful. They were kind of a respite from what was going on in the country, the despair and and the financial um, crash. Um, people needed entertainment. Uh, so, and in fact, actually, um, the technique that Walt used for his original short, Steamboat Willie, was so successful and innovative that the technique became known as Mickey Mousing. Um, so, therefore, it didn't take long for Walt to see that a feature length animated film would be successful if potentially you know, expensive and difficult, which it was. Thus, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was born, um, though other movies could easily have been first. Um, at the studio, I mean, they were talking about Bambi and Pinocchio in those early years as well, but there was something about Snow White that really captured Walt's imagination. And so that was the first uh, feature length animated film, um, which premiered in 1937. Um, and uh, even though many women at the studio were uh, involved in the making of Snow White, only two received on-screen credit for their work. Um, and it was also interesting that famously one of the women who worked in the story department, Dorothy Ann Blank, she was actually a secretary, yet there you could see her there. Uh, she was a secretary who also did some more important things as, as she became, uh, as her intelligence and, and uh, was recognized and so on. In any event, uh, she served as the model for the evil queen here in Snow White and when uh, the male animator who conceived of the evil queen told her that she took it with good humor, which I thought was good on her, but uh, nonetheless, again, um, but a lot of the women who worked on the film didn't receive any credit and you know it was a it was a common source of of bad feelings at the studio for many years but that began to change as more women went to work for disney and ideas about who contributed what became more equitable um part of that was the result of the interruptions of world war ii i think um and heather i know has uh you know, looked more deeply into what those disruptions caused for the studio. Yes, um, World War II 
definitely brought disruptions around the world, of course. Um, I, I think one of the beginning disruptions for Walt personally was it put a stop to his um, escapist project of Alice in Wonderland, but that was just a harbinger of what was to come. Um, the good thing for the women was that it did open up some jobs after a layoff, but the more difficult part is instead of focusing on um, feature films and more creative options, they were asked to make um, commercials and war propaganda. Um, Victory Through Air Power is a best-selling, though extremely controversial um, novel that was adapted into a movie and was pitched as you know the answers to every question America had regarding Pearl Harbor. And um, it lost the studio half a million dollars. Um, but <laughs> um, Disney had some success in the post-war years, though they did have a lot of trouble during it, uh, most notably with Cinderella and Peter Pan, but there were absolutely some missteps, don't you think? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, after the war, I think one of the uh, major missteps was Song of the South, which as soon as you say it, I think everybody kind of cringes a little bit. I mean, it was released in 1946. It inspired protests. Um, it's typically considered the biggest embarrassment for the studio. Um, Song of the South was based on the Uncle Remus stories, and its deeply problematic portrayal of African-Americans made it one of the most infamous Disney features of all time. Notably, it was never, like all the other Disney classics, released to any home video format. Um, the author does suggest that Mary Blair attempted to show some more nuance about what life was really like in the South, but any you know, negative um, information was cut from the final film. Walt seemed to have a blind spot about this for, for whatever reason. Um, and this wouldn't, of course, be the last time that Disney would run afoul of racial sensitivity and nuance, um, even yet to this day, right? Uh, Peter Pan, when it was released in 1953, would come under fire for its portrayals of the Indian camp of Neverland, um, basically which trafficked in Native American stereotypes and uh, essentially homogenized the enormous diversity of indigenous groups into one very broad caricature. So that was uh, one of the problems with Peter Pan. But also Tinkerbell caused some controversy. Here we go. Uh, she, partly because she was, she was a fairy, um, but they drew her, they portrayed her as a full grown woman with curves and everything else and a, a very modern haircut. And so that caused a little bit of discussion. Um, in addition, her temperament, as you can see from the slide here, was a little bit naughty and uh, she expressed herself very uh, openly, even if she didn't speak. And the male animators were not always happy with this um, kind of outspoken and uh, temper, temper tantrum prone character. Um, but, it wasn't all bad at this time either. Uh, oh, that's right. I forgot about this. Thank you, Heather, for pulling up that slide. Yeah, this wasn't the first time that, you know, there was some controversy over how uh, female characters were portrayed. When you go all the way back to Fantasia, Fantasia you have the female animators, their uh, example there on the left, creating fairies who um, were basically uh, these pure ephemeral creatures um, even in their nakedness, they looked innocent and, and gentle. Uh, while the male animators famously created the centaurettes, which are, you know, sexualized, coquettish versions of, of centaurs. Um, and they even created some black centaurettes who uh, behaved in, you know, subservient and obsequious ways, there, thereby getting Disney into uh, trouble with racial stereotypes yet again. So, you know, Disney has always been a source of controversy. And again, that that continues to this day. Um, but again, it's, you know, there's not, there's always some um, good things to come out of the conversation. And after the war, Walt started thinking about his uh, boyhood, his uh, idealized time at like Main Street USA, which you can imagine the segue, is when he starts thinking about the theme park. So as somebody who went to college, right, <laughs> and grew up in Southern California, I'll pass it over to Heather. And, you know, I know you learned some, some new things about the making of Disneyland by reading this book. 
Yes, I definitely have some uh, frequent flyer miles on the Dumble ride, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I read that Disneyland was made so quickly and pushed out and introduced to the public so quickly that the pavement was still wet and took on the imprints of the high heels of the visitors who attended there, which was shocking to me because when you go through the park, you don't get a sense of haste at all. You get a sense of just artistry and wonder. And I think we talk about world building in a literary sense um, where you know the, the author can take a person into their imagination and really make a whole new world come alive. And that's something that Walt Disney and his team were able to do in a physical reality. And so as you move through the different lands, you do get a sense of that American utopia um, on Main Street. And then you move on and you go to the Tiki Room where singing birds greet you and you get a show that's better than Vegas. So <laughs> it, really, um, it was really fascinating to me to see the team that did work on it and know about all of the work and the artistry that went into making such a um, wonderful project and one of my favorite places on the world. So, um, after Walt's death, the studio had some setbacks and detours before it inches its way into what many people call the studio's renaissance, starting with The Little Mermaid in 1989. How did these films change how a new generation saw Disney? Yeah, the, the renaissance was a big time. Um, I'm going to kind of quickly condense many years of Disney history uh, because after, well, actually, even before Walt's death, for, through the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, Walt Disney didn't really produce a lot of animated films. They became too expensive and they took too long. And so the live action films more reliably made them profit. So there wasn't a lot of uh, great stuff coming out of that time. Um, like 101 Dalmatians is a film that was essentially made possible by the Xerox machine, because instead of animators having to painstakingly redraw each scene, they could just Xerox these essentially black and white um, images and use them as, uh, you know, background footage and, and so on. So while one, one, while 101 Dalmatians uh, did get some good reviews, it really is a very simple and not very artistic film in, in the, in the, in the sense of the Disney's golden age. But the Renaissance begins, as, as Heather mentioned, with The Little Mermaid. Um, and so Ariel introduces a new generation to the idea of the Disney princess, which has always been problematic and Ariel is no exception, right? She has to lose her voice in order to get what she wants, which is of course a man um, and so on. However, uh, to give the Little Mermaid credit, um, the creation of Ursula, for example, represented a return to the studio's high standards of artistic creation. Um, and not to mention the musical contributions, Alan Menken and, and Howard Ashman, um, their uh, musical compositions really make the film. And again, this returns Disney to its roots where music becomes central to telling the story again, as with say Fantasia. Um, then after The Little Mermaid, we have Beauty and the Beast which introduces, thank goodness, a different kind of Disney princess. I mean, really, Belle has no truck with all that princess shtick. Uh, instead, she's more interested in reading books. So, uh, of course, she's my personal favorite, and I think many, many well-read women's personal favorite out of the Disney princess uh, canon. Um, after Beauty and the Beast, uh, they release Aladdin. Um, and while Aladdin has some problems with its cultural and racial stereotypes, um, it also has another strong princess in Jasmine. She famously says, right, I am not a prize to be won in the movie. Um, so even though, you know, she's somewhat sexualized and that can be problematic, she is another strong female uh, princess that we have. And then of course there was the huge success that was The Lion King. So all of these movies made a lot of money and Disney, you know, returns with a roar Sorry about the pun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, regains a lot of a lot of ground with a new generation of kids and adults. Um, and then, of course, Pixar comes into the picture, thereby, thereby changing uh, animation forever. Um, computer animation wins the day, um, changes the game forever. Uh, Toy Story, the original Pixar uh, feature length film, 
uh, not only changed how animated films were made forever, but also heightened the quality of storytelling um, in the opinions of many people, mine included. And what's important is that women were instrumental in the making of all of these films. None more so than the phenom uh, that is the little film called Frozen. And um, Heather, as someone with a four-year-old daughter, uh, is the one more well equipped to talk about how important Frozen has been to a whole new generation of kids and parents alike. Yes, when Frozen first came out, I was working at an elementary school and I would find clusters of little girls sitting in circles, holding hands, singing Let It Go. It was adorable. <laughs> and then, um, almost 10 years later, here comes Frozen 2, and it's still just as exciting um, to a whole new group of kids as is the original Frozen. Um, my daughter's four, and she's you know, just as excited about it as, you know, the kids 10 years ago were. Um, and it's a phenomenon, not just because of the music, but also because the the story is so different. We don't have a princess anymore. We have a queen who famously said, you can't marry a man you just met. Um, so it kind of flips the switch. And then we have um, this queen who is asked to express herself in order to move forward in her story. Um, she's not searching for a romantic partner. She's searching for sisterly love. And that's what saves the day. Um, then we have Princess Anna, who is endlessly optimistic, and she's adventurous, and she is so loyal. And they've created a, a group of women that I want my child to look up to. Um, and I think that would be impossible without the five women we talked about. Um, it's not just the art that they inspired. They set the stage for a strong, vocal woman to be in a story, um, to be someone we celebrate as a group um, because they came in and they said, no, we have a voice, we have talent, we have intellect, and they were able to change how Disney um, operated, really. Um, they brought success to Disney and they brought an idea into our minds that this is what women can become. And right, and it, it, must be, it must be noted that um, Frozen, was the first uh, Oscar winning animated film uh, that grossed over a billion dollars and was directed by a woman. So not only were women, and I mean, Mary Blair's art, as I think Heather mentioned earlier, was uh, part of the inspiration for how Frozen looked. Um, so we go all the way back to the beginning, um, all the way through to having a female director of a movie that's really about female empowerment in all sorts of uh, specific ways, so. Yes, um, yes, Mary Blair's art was found in the morgue and um, yeah, she was, I mean, there's so much impact in how things progressed because of, because of the morgue and because of yeah. Mary Blair. Um, for a few read-alikes, just to draw you in, we, um, have a few options for you. If you are really intrigued by the ink and paint process and the women who worked there, um, ink and paint is a great option. If you found the storyline of women who really changed their industry, Monster She Wrote is about women who changed the horror and speculative fiction industry. Um, if the actual art behind the um, the movies is what is really drawing to you. Wild Minds goes through the artist and the um, techniques that changed animation. And then um, the hidden art of Disney's golden age is called the, they drew as they pleased. Um, it's where I found a lot of the art that we found um, to present to you. And it's, it's a fantastic little book. Um, also, if you're really interested in deep diving <laughs> into Disney, uh, TCCL has a few databases that would be really helpful. So Pop Culture Universe, um, Gale in Context for Biographies, uh, Daily Life Through History, and ArtistWorks.com if you want to learn how to draw. So highly recommend those. All right, do we have any questions? Uh, just a second. I think we've got one one comment here. Um, it's been a few months since I read the book. Thanks for the excellent review and slides. Do I remember something about executive rooms that were closed to the women? Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> care to expand on that? Yes, I think that is, you know, would have put really well in the harassment section. Um, the executive rooms were on the rooftop and not only were they closed off to the women, they also featured nude portraits and had um, just, it was just a boys club and uh, it was endorsed by Walt, which is unfortunate. Um, and I think, Melanie, we talked a little bit about after his death, what some of the men did in terms of magazines? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, well, while well, Walt was still alive, I mean, he he did try to uh, maintain some standards. He 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 wanted the women to feel comfortable and so on. Um, but after his death, it, the the harassment actually amped up for a while. I mean, there were pictures from Hustler magazine behind the desk of the Hyperion Club, as I think what it was called, that rooftop club on, at the studios. And, uh, and in fact, actually, one of the female employees, this was during the 70s, she started uh, posting pictures of, of uh, out of Playgirl <laughs> of nude men for a while. And it took them a while to figure out that she had pulled this prank. But once they figured it out, that, that stuff came down. So women were actually speaking out against this stuff as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, in the modern era, we have the, the Me Too movement which is still, you know, very active and, and very important in Hollywood in general. Um, you know, I know that uh, there have been um, Hollywood, I mean, uh, some, I can't remember which one of the Pixar directors was accused of, of sexual harassment and John Lasseter, I believe, um, one of the original guys who worked on Toy Story. So, you know, he's had some comeuppance as well. So in any event, that the harassment from them breaking down uh, Bianca's door in the beginning, and then they put a pig underneath, uh, I think, Grace's desk um, to the, you know, images from Hustler and the men's only club to the Me Too movement today. Disney's still dealing with the legacy, as most Hollywood studios are. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've, I've lost, I've lost the screen. Um, is uh, does someone else have a question yeah i think yeah I oh sorry <laughs> um barbara says nice job did you hear gladwell's program on the little mermaid i have not but i will now <laughs> yeah yeah no it sounds interesting no i haven't heard it either barbara if you could put in the chat if that is on youtube or where people can listen to that I'm sure we have a lot of Malcolm Gladwell fans. He's excellent. <laughs> and a question from Marion. In the modern era, are the animations actually drawn? Um, are they drawn? Are they hand drawn or is it computer animation? I believe it's a combination of both. I think mostly it's commuter, uh, computer animation. There was just recently released um, a film that was hand drawn and that was really exciting. I can't remember which one, but I know that it's um, a newer one. Um, but yeah, I think a good majority of the work is done through animation just for the cost effectiveness of it. Um, it takes a much smaller team to do it that way. Right, sure. right absolutely. <laughs> and art. yeah, Heather, I know what you're, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, the concept art is still drawn, which is what the animators we talked about did mostly. Uh, sorry, Melanie. No, 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 no worries. Um, yeah, no, it's still, I mean, they still do the storyboarding where, you know, they do visual images of, of the different scenes and plot of the movie and, and so on. But you're right. I think most of it's done by computer. And I know what you're talking about there. There is a studio that's based in Ireland that does everything the old fashioned Disney way. They, they do all of the uh, drawing by hand and they released they've released three or four feature length animated films that the critics have, have gone wild for. But, you know, I, as far as I know, Disney still uh, relies you know, mostly on the computer animation just for cost effectiveness. All right, and Barbara says uh, the Little Mermaid thing is on um, Malcolm's Revisionist History podcast site. So thank you for that, Barbara. We don't have any other questions right now. All 
All right, that looks like that's all the questions. Janet, do you want to send us off? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. I'm not quite sure what I touched, but I, I have audio, but I don't have anything else. Um, <laughs> I thank you, Heather and Melanie, so much. We've really enjoyed this presentation. Um, like I told you before we started, I would not have been able to read it. I was just infuriated at all of the horrible things those guys were doing to these ladies. Um, Thank you for attending our uh, fourth VSI session. Uh, we will have our um, fifth session next Monday at the same time with um, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict. And Julia Thomas will be uh, our reviewer. So we hope that you'll jo join us then. Uh, in the meantime, have a pleasant day. And again, thank you ladies for your excellent presentation. Sure, you're very welcome. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>